A couple of weeks ago, a 14-foot, 1,700-pound great white shark meandered into a lagoon near Woods Hole. And there she remains while environmental officials try to steer her to open waters. With that as a backdrop, enter Peter Benchley, author of Jaws, who is here in town for an event involving his memorabilia at BU. But Greater Boston's Jared Bowen gets us started with that shark. It's rather like a giant fishbowl, and so the great white shark in Woods Hole continues circling this 20-foot deep lagoon. It entered by way of an extremely high tide. Now the tides have backed off a little bit, and the shark is naturally um, you know, hesitant about going over a shoal because it doesn't know that on the other side is the open ocean. For nine days now, the 14-foot female, weighing an estimated 1,700 pounds, has been slicing through the water. Environmental officials are trying to lead her out because, as the New England Aquarium's Gregory Stone said today, we led her in. Humans are always create, uh, put, moving in concrete blocks and boulders to maintain things and create things and uh, docks and uh, shorefront development. It's a very dramatically different coastline than, than the coastline under which this animal evolved for you know hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. These animals are not the great powerful monsters that some people have made them out to be over the years. Uh, who, I don't know who did it, but he should deserve a speaking to. Coincidentally, Peter Benchley, the man who injected the fear of Jaws into a large public conscience, is in town today for the opening of an exhibit of his work at Boston University. He took time to stop by the aquarium. Nature takes great care with her apex predators. She doesn't want too many, so this animal is pups very few and is not accustomed to dealing with man. And for all their power, they are amazingly fragile. He is going to continue to feed here as long as there is food in the water. While Jaws may have left some audiences drowning in fear in writing his novel and later screenplay, Peter Benchley never meant for the story to demonize the great white to great fright. Just pay attention to the Richard Dreyfuss character in the film, Benchley has said. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. That book and that work didn't create our fear of sharks. People have had a fear of sharks and other large predators uh, since time began. Though it launched a significant literary, cinematic, and scientific career, Benchley has admitted he couldn't, in good conscience, write Jaws today. So he spent the last 30 years studying sharks. He's seen the oceans become depleted, not only sharks, but many other types of, of fishes. And he's now devoting his life to uh, restoring the oceans, not just sharks, but all the depleted parts of the ocean. Ultimately, what Peter Benchley has revealed is that a fear of sharks is much less dramatically a fear of the unknown. And with me now is Peter Benchley, author of Jaws and the Deep. Welcome. Thank you. So is that true? You feel like you couldn't write that? novel now, Jaws, knowing what you know? No, uh, I've got to remember how long ago that was. There was no Earth Day <laughs> when I was writing that book. There was no environmental consciousness at all. We assumed the oceans were forever. They were invulnerable to man. Nobody could do anything to, to really hurt the ocean. And so an environmental sense really didn't exist and nobody knew anything about sharks. Now, we don't still don't know a great deal, but what we do know, you certainly couldn't, I couldn't demonize the animal. What will we learn, <clears throat> do you think, from the tagging of this female shark that they've got at this lagoon, assuming it gets out, let's hope that it does. What, what kinds of things might we learn from it? The possibilities are endless. You've got to, as you say, first of all, hope it gets out to freedom. Uh, but nobody knows how long they live, when they breed. They think it's between 20 and 30 years old. They guess that they pup four to six sometimes. Nobody really is sure. They don't know whether they're coastal animals or, or uh, they go everywhere. The assumption was that they're coastal and one turned up in Hawaii from, who was tagged in San Francisco. So nobody really knows a great deal at all. And they're, they're loners. So where does the breeding take place and how do they hook up and how do they Very signal? Very carefully. <laughs> uh, they, are, uh, they are loners, but don't, nobody knows how they, how they communicate. In South Africa, you'll find them in great profusion at certain times of the year around seal colonies. And I have to, I don't know, but I have to assume that there's a breeding season when, when nature gets them together and they exude some sort of breeding sign. And we don't really even know. No. What would this uh, great white be doing in the lagoon? Would she be feeding in there or might, might she have already eaten something and she's fine just swimming around or...? Again, nobody knows. The, it's, it's not extraordinary for them to come into a lagoon like that. It's, it's extraordinary for them to come into such shallow water and then not be able to get out, of course. 
but they'll cruise everywhere. And great white sharks are not particularly rare around this coast. The largest one ever taken was taken off Montauk, Long Island. I've seen them off Block Island. I've seen them off Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. They're just very rare in general. So the fact that there's one showed up here uh, is it's not extraordinary, but it's 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 a very rare occurrence no matter where you are in the world. We've had all these shark episodes in the last couple mm -hmm. of years, you know, a couple of them quite dramatic, the, the surfer who had her arm bitten off. But you've said that really they're not they're not predator of man. I mean, they, if they come into contact with man, there's a curiosity, maybe a you know, a bite factor, sort of the tactile sense. What, what are they looking for? But they're not really looking to eat a person. Generally, that's true. We're not their normal food. And too bony, too, too skinny, <laughs> bony, and we're not fat enough, yeah. uh, despite what some people think about themselves. <laughs> and uh, what this animal, the particular great white shark, wants more than anything else is a big fat seal. And he sees a profile on the surface, and we do look like sea lions from below. And white sharks particularly are ambush predators. They come up from below and behind. And so they come up and they test bite. That's the only way that any of them can really test and see what they've got. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trouble is when a 3,000-pound animal takes a nip out of you to see whether you're edible, by the time he says you're not, it's a little late. And, uh, you know, people bleed to death. But 70% of the people who get bitten by great white sharks survive because the shark doesn't come back. It's a nibble and it isn't good enough. Well, yeah, and so they go away. But it, it, what we've discovered in the past few years is that in a veritable millisecond of the bite, the shark can determine whether what it's about to eat or not is economically caloric in, in the sense of, is this worth the effort I'm going to expend to eat it? And if it isn't, I'm leaving. Now, that's a very sophisticated judgment to yeah. make in a, just a snap second. We always hear these cliches about uh, sharks in terms of their ability to smell blood or to sense blood. What is that? Is it, is it a sense of smell, literally? What is it? Well, none of the senses except sight are really what we think of as those senses. They don't hear the way we hear, for instance. They have things called the lateral line, and they have these dots in their heads called the ampullae of Lorenzini, which sense electromagnetic changes, sound, pressure changes, all sorts of different things in the water. So if you take the eyes away from a shark because it's nighttime or lousy looking water or whatever else, he uses other senses to home in on his prey. Again, if they can't see, they bite at random. And if, they, if they're biting at random, they might bite a human being by mistake. And once the human being is bleeding, then the, the sense of the smell comes in, and the, the smell is very important because a wounded animal, whatever it is, they know blood means wounded animal. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you're working on now environmentally? The people at the aquarium told us it was, goes far beyond sharks. One of the things that I'm, I'm lobbying for uh, is the marine protected areas. That it's, there's a general consensus now that the only way really to keep the oceans from completely collapsing is to create certain marine protected areas in which fish of all kinds can be protected from all kind of fishing, commercial and recreational so that the fish can have a chance to breed, grow up, become as big as they want, as they should become, and then they leave. And, and there's a lot of evidence that when you do create an effective MPA, marine protected area, the fish around them out in the, in the open are bigger, there are more of them, that they're very effective. But the fishing communities, both, again, recreational and commercial, scream bloody murder. Well, you know, well, we were very conscious of that, of course, around here. But there was just a report last week, in fact, about a new... Uh, netting system that would go much, much closer to the bottom of the ocean in terms of getting lobsters and that kind of thing because so many whales, and whales in particular, are getting hooked into these huge fishing nets. Mm -hmm. Well, then the nets, the, the two big critters are, are the long lines, which can go up to 80 miles, yeah, believe 80 it or miles, not. I know, it's just and, amazing. And these gigantic nets. And the, the things in the Sea of Cortez and other way down in the Gulf Coast, these, these huge basic scoops that go along the bottom, they're a net, but they're weighted, and they just clean the yeah. bottom out, taking, I think the figure is something like five pounds of other fish that are killed yeah, for every garbage. pound of shrimp. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's awful. You know, you were telling me just before we started talking here that uh, a, a brand new shark, a, a baby female shark, a white, great white, got scooped up in one of these nets. And tell me what happened there. Well, it was caught in a fisherman's net off Malibu, California. And fortunately, the fisherman uh, had the wit and the public service to, to call the aquarium down there. And they called, they came and they got the shark. She was 
four feet long and weighed 62 pounds, which is very, very close to newborn. And, that is amazing. <laughs> and they, so Monterey sent down a, 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 a transfer tank. Uh, it looked like a great big oil tank truck. And they took it up to Monterey. And she's now in a million gallon tank and is eating and has been now for a world record 17 days in captivity. That's great. She's not doing what a lot of them did, which is bump their heads against the glass tank and refusing to eat. Mm. So they'd injure themselves and then they'd have to be let free. But this one is still four feet and something. But uh, I believe she was so young that she just has nothing else to gauge what's normal from and that perhaps the aquarium is teaching her normalcy. Mm, let's hope. So now you're part of the infamous, or I should say famous, Howard Gottlieb collection at Boston University. He's got your papers and your memorabilia. He's had my grandfather. I guess it's on display now, or it's about to be. I guess it is, yes. I we shot a little of it. Yeah. Ah, he's a great guy, and they've got he's terrific wonderful. things down there. So that'll be fun. Yeah. And Everybody my grandfather's stuff is down there, and my father's. So it's yeah, a, it's I saw that. That's wonderful. All right, mm -hmm. Peter Benchley, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right, and that's it for Greater Boston. Tomorrow night, it's Beat the Press, the endless ramp up and spin over the presidential debate, looking back at how the press treated former House Speaker Tom Finneran. And hold the tote bags. There's a dust up over the proposed sale of a public radio station in Providence. That and more tomorrow at 7. I'm Emily Rooney. Good night. For more on Greater Boston, visit our website at www.wgbh.org slash greater Boston.